Okay, everybody, let's get into terrain analysis in Grass 8. So, just to refresh, uh, we had the sort of basics of what Grass is, how to get it going, and how to do your basic, you know, data view and manipulation, that kind of stuff. We are going to sort of continue talking about uh, tips for how to use Grass, but we're going to do it in the context of achieving specific kinds of analysis. And this week it's all about raster analysis and specifically uh, terrain analysis, analysis of topography. So uh, in project two, if you're following along with the tutorial, we're going to basically cover part one and part two. And part two is uh, subsidiary to uh, terrain analysis. It's sort of a little bit more vector querying, but it's part of the whole workflow that we're working through in project two. So these two things kind of go together. We're going to try and cover them today. So let's get into grass. Uh, basically, this is where we left off. I have my uh, map displays and the computational region set to match the uh, Wadi Hassa 30 meter SRTM digital elevation model. I have the Wadi Hassa sites here on the left and the Wadi Hassa North Bank sites on the right. Just to clarify these, I'm going to style them. So I just double click there to get into the properties. I'm just going to go to the symbols and for the North Bank survey, I'm going to pick a circle over here and uh, I'm just going to fill them in, uh, in red. Why not? Click OK. So there we have the North Bank sites. I'm just going to leave the Wadi Hassa sites with X's for the time being. I'm just going to leave them up for now uh, and eventually we're going to do some SQL querying to get a subset of sites out of there. But for now, I'm just going to leave them up there. We're basically going to work, uh, start working with the idea that we'll use the Wadi Hassa survey uh, data as our sort of control data set or the data set that we're going to use when we eventually get to predictive modeling. And we'll leave the Wadi Hassa North Bank survey as its sort of testing data set to see if any predictive model we eventually get to in project three has any weight. Okay? A little foreshadowing. Uh, but for the time being, let's start, and uh, in fact, what I'm really going to do is just to look at uh, the DEM. By default, it's colored in this sort of blue through green to yellow color scheme that's called Veritas. But maybe you want to change the color scheme. So let's uh, work on raster styling. The easiest way is just to double click, and you get to the DRAST. Again, you can right click and go to properties, or you can click on that little box there too. Um, here you can do a couple of different things uh, but the first thing you want might want to be able to do is to only display values of a certain uh, colors between a certain value so you might not want to see anything let's say below sea level and so if this map has negative values you might want to just make those kind of go away just for visual purposes so you can put zero dash and then pick an absolute maximum let's say a thousand meters and hit apply and anything that is above a thousand meters it looks white but actually it's no day null at this point and anything below zero would uh, would also be white in our case if our map area was a little bit bigger the Dead Sea is actually just off you know that way to the west so it would actually disappear as well now in this particular case that's not terribly useful other than quickly showing us where the thousand meter ISO yet is in our elevation map uh, but let's say we were looking at slope or something and we really wanted to get rid of some of these other values just for display purposes this is helpful okay so that's basically the only thing you can really do in the DRAST that is semi useful other than load a new map in to change the colors you can right click on this and go down to where it says set color table and it brings up a module called R Colors. Now, in Grass, there's almost always two or three different ways to pull up the same tool. You could get to this from Raster, Manage Colors, R Colors. And as long as we had selected a raster map previously in our layer manager, it will pull in the name over here where it says name of raster map. So effectively, we've done the same thing. If we had more than one raster map, we could leave the same R colors up and just from here select a variety of them. And uh, once we get a few raster maps made, we'll be able to see that they'll show up there. 
And so you can just use the module up and quickly change the colors for all the maps in your layer tree, which is a nice thing because then you don't have to continually right click and choose, you know, change colors, etc. Okay? So again, there are tabs here along the top. If you don't like them along the top, you can go into the settings, preferences, and uh, I think it's, uh, I have to look at where it is, uh, tools, I think. I never change it. It's in here somewhere. You can put them as tabs along the side if you wanted to. Um, but basically, you're almost always going to have to click on more than one tab in order to parameterize the routine before it does it. So the first tab is the map, only the map selection. You can pick a different map in here. Automatically, our one got chosen. We we'll go to the define tab, and this is where we get to choose our color table. So if we click here, name of color table, we have all of these different color tables that we can choose from. Let's pick one that's SRTM, since this is an SRTM, and just hit run. And you can see the module stays open, and now we've changed the color. And maybe we're pleased with the way that looks, but maybe we think it looks a little bit drab. So what we could do, go back to the define tab, we could pick another one of these things and uh, you know there's one that's specifically called terrain so we could run that and um, maybe we like that maybe we don't um, or we'll just put it back on the SRTM because that was the one I wanted to show you with we could do something called stretching or uh, equalizing the color scheme and it may or it may not work depending on your data but what you would do is just then check, the, check this box called histogram equalization and hit run and it may look terrible like it did here because it's going to pull the values to the extreme from the zero point to the maximum point but only with the data that's in your working computational region so in our case SRTM color scheme has this dark color which is supposed to represent things below zero because it does show the ocean and that kind of stuff so it's not the best color scheme to stretch like this but we could switch to, uh, let's see, let's say the sepia color stream. Let's take off the equalization so I can show you what it looked like before. Looked like that. Looks pretty good. But if we click that button, we get a little bit more dramatic of an effect, right? And so depending on the color scheme, histogram equalization might work really well for you. Um, the other option is a logarithmic scaling. And if we do that, it really, in this case, kind of washes that out because what it does is it starts off with big increments and then the increments get smaller, or this, the other way around, small increments, and then the increments get bigger over time. So it doesn't work with sepia, but let's just see if it works with SRTM. In this case, it really doesn't work at all with that. Um, but it might work with uh, something like a... Um, uh, more like an image, like a satellite image or something like that. So uh, let's go back. I like that sepia well enough with the histogram stretch. Um, actually, we can even go back to our, um, let's see where our Veritas is there, and leave the histogram stretch, and maybe that would look good too. Yeah, so there gives us a little bit more relief. Um, so this is just visual, right? It doesn't really do anything in terms of changing the numbers underneath it's literally just the colors that are mapped to the numbers and if we wanted to we could add our raster legend to this and uh, we get a color scale over here which helps us map the visual colors to the actual numbers that are in the raster data over here and that helps us understand change in this case a change in elevation so what if we wanted to have a little bit more like 3D kind of a pop to our view? Well, there is a 3D viewer, but before we do that, um, there's a special way for elevation, uh, digital elevation models to get a kind of um, a still flat map view, but to make it look pseudo 3D, and that's called doing a hill shade. So let's do that. Um, if we go to the raster menu up here in the top and we go down to the terrain analysis tool over here um, what we can do is find our shaded relief r dot relief and it's called compute shaded relief and that pops up over here and again because I have selected this in the layer tree it automatically pulls the name in but if not I would just select the map just by clicking on the little arrow 
And here now we have an output, name for output shaded relief map. So I'm just going to call it Hasa 30M Shade. I'm just going to use all capitals. Now we can't have any spaces and we can't use any dashes in the names because dashes will be interpreted when we do raster math as a minus sign and spaces is just a thing it doesn't want you to do. So I use underscores. You can use periods, although that can get confusing. Or you can decide to write in, um, what is it, this, I can't remember the, the name for it. There's a special case where you use capitals uh, like this. You know, it's a programming language thing where you just capitalize the first letter of every word, but you don't use any spaces. <laughs> you could do it this way. I came up with, in, in the underscore kind of generation 30 meter shade okay and you've got some other tabs over here we can change the position of the sun and you know by default it puts it kind of early I think early morning or early afternoon you could change it and it will change the sort of way that it's popped and you can exaggerate it by really putting the sun down you know at the horizon or something like that but the defaults are generally okay the only other thing that you might want to change is this factor for exaggerating relief. This is the Z exaggeration factor. One to one is normal, so I'll show you that right now, and then we'll do like a two or a three to one and see what that looks like. So at this particular point, we've parameterized everything we want. We have the name of our output map. It says add created map into the layer tree, which is fine. That's checked by default. We'll just hit run. And there is our shaded relief, our one to one shaded relief. Okay. I'll show you how uh, we can use this in a second, but just briefly while we still have this open, I'll go in here and I'll change this to a three times vertical exaggeration. And here I'll put another underscore and I'll put three X, three times vertical exaggeration. And then I'll just hit run. And now we can see the three X is just like, you know, everything's a little bit more bold, okay? So the first thing that we can do is to drop these underneath and then we can right click uh, on our SRTM which is now the one that's on top and we can go to um, change opacity level there it is and so we can just make this like um, somewhere in the realm of like 60 percent opacity and it doesn't really matter we might want to change that and what we can see now is that we can basically still see the color from the SOTM, but we can see through it, and the black and white shading from the hill shade is underneath it, and it kind of starts to pop up at us. And of course, you can play around with the opacity. Maybe 60 is too much. Let's go to like 75 or something like that. And you can kind of play around with it that way. And just for fun, let's take a look. This is the 1x, and this is the 3x. 1x. 3x. So you can basically see how much exaggeration adds to the pop that you get. Now that's the simplest way, just changing the opacity. Let's undo all of that and we'll add a special hill shade layer. So this is the normal add raster map layer and then there's add various raster map layers just next to it. And in there you'll see shaded relief map layer. And now you have the ability to pick first your shaded relief and second the color map to drape over it. And so I'll pick SRTM. And optionally, you can brighten it over here, but let's just click Apply. And you can see, instead of looking kind of washed out like we had with uh, the one where we used opacity, instead it looks almost too dark. So here's where you might want to apply some brightening. Let's just add 10 and see what that does for us. It's looking better. I find usually somewhere around 30. Uh, is a nice sort of starting point and you might want to go even higher let's try 50 yeah that's sort of looking pretty nice on my screen and the only deal here uh, is that if you want to now switch from the we we picked the 3x if you want to switch you have to open D shade again which you can do simply by double clicking now on that layer and go in here and pick the other, the, the regular shade map, the first one we made. And now we're switching back and forth between the exaggerated shaded relief and the one-to-one -one shaded relief. So this is a good approach. If you want to show some topography, 
in some 3D pop to the topography, but you don't want to go into the true 3D view, which is a perspective view. This is still a plan view, a map view, and this is acceptable for making a plan view map because when we put our sights back on top of this, um, in this case now the black axes are kind of hard to see, so I'm going to uh, just change them to be, uh, let's just change them to be white axes. And uh, what I'll do is just increase the symbol size from 5 to 7, and then we'll be able to see that a little bit better, right? So what we can do now is have that topography shown in pseudo 3D, but have it still be a plan view map so that the horizontal distances between everything uh, is still to scale, okay? So this is really good for, for making little figures where you want to show something about the topography but you also still need to show your data in plan view, okay? So let's go ahead and uncheck everything here. Now that's important because when we go into the true 3D, I'm going to change the opacity back to 100%, it's going to try and put anything that has got a check mark in the layer manager, it's going to try and put anything uh, that is currently visible into a 3D view and it's going to try and use the numbers that are in that raster map to render the 3D view. And the shade maps have nonsensical numbers. They're basically 0 to 255 white to black just to show the shade value. So you don't want them to be checked. And in this particular case I'm just going to right click and remove those layers to get them out and we'll leave the other one unchecked because maybe later we want to we want to work with it at some point when we make a flat map. But to switch to the 3D view, just make sure anything you want to visualize is checked. And then go over to the map display and click where it says 2D view and switch it to the 3D view. And we get a brand new perspective on this and we get a whole new tab over here. So this is a little bit funny for people who aren't used to navigating in 3D. The tools up here still work. I can pan around. But now I'm like floating in the air like in a helicopter and I'm looking down at this little square of landscape. And I can still zoom in. In this case, each click brings me in or my mouse wheel can bring me in or out. I can now have a couple of new uh, interaction things so I can actually spin by clicking and dragging on the thing right here. And it's a little bit funny to do at first, uh, like so. Or I can have this weird airplane view, which you kind of click and hold, and you kind of fly through it. And you might be wondering why it's blurring out. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. The other way you can control your view is over here by clicking and dragging this this uh, view angle. So you have to imagine you're the dot, and the land center of the landscape is the center over this place, and you're just moving where you're looking from. And these are the cardinal directions, so I'm putting myself in the southwest corner looking up the wadi now at this particular point. Now over here I can change the uh, tilt, I guess, of the, you know, the vertical tilt. So technically the height of my perspective above the ground, but because it's an angle to the center point, it, it kind of tilts the map when you do it that way. And I can change the z-exaggeration here, so I can go to my 3x z-exaggeration here if, if I really wanted to, right? Um, in that case, I might have to raise myself up or lower myself down, depending on the case, maybe. Let's set the z-exag back to 1. And uh, also, I can kind of change, this is uh, perspective. It's really just like a zoom telephoto lens. I'm far away but I can set it to be zoomed in closer and it will, it will distort the image a little bit but bring it closer to me or I can set it to be more like a wide angle. So basically the more to the left the more you're zoomed in and the more to the right the more you're zoomed out. Okay. So by default it's usually set at a reasonable perspective somewhere there and then tilt is the XY tilt and we usually, we usually want to leave that at zero. By the way you can just enter zero in there and hit enter and it will it wherever you want. So for example, to set the exact to 5, I can just put 5 and hit enter, and I can put 1 and hit enter. That's a little bit more precise, okay? And then there's some navigation things. Look here, and then, oops, I can click uh, on the map, and it will center that point, and depending on how my perspective is, it might throw it off to the side. 
I can always hit click center and it resets it to the center. I can put it look from the top. I can reset to the initial condition. So there's a lot of useful little buttons there. Um, I'll just make this guy a little bit bigger so that everything shows up. I can change the background color if I don't like the white. I can change it to black or I can change it to gray or red or whatever I want, right? Uh, I'm just going to leave it at on white like so. Uh, so that's the view tab. We have a data tab and an appearance tab, an analysis tab, and then an animation tab. So the data tab, if we had multiple layers loaded in here, and you can have multiple layers loaded at the same time. It can get confusing, but you can bring them in here and you can actually separate them so they're hovering above each other. There's a lot you can do in the 3D view. Um, but really what we typically want to do, the first thing, is to change the resolution. There's a fine mode and a coarse mode, and by default, it sets it to lower than the native resolution of the file you're looking at. Here it's set to a uh, six cell resolution. Let's just change fine to one. And if we hit enter, and we go back here and just drag around to a view that we like. Let's look at it from this side. And I'm just going to zoom in a little bit more. So now we actually see some detail in the landscape because we're showing each individual cell at the native resolution of um, get a better perspective on this. And again, uh, the 3D perspective navigation <laughs> is definitely something that you're going to want to play around with and get used to. In fact, I'm going to make my screen over here bigger. Hey, get big. There we go. Uh, yeah, that's something like so seems reasonable to me at this particular moment. Okay. Let's now, when we now set our Z exaggeration, it's actually going to be a bit more useful of a thing for us to be able to do. Okay. And uh, let's see if we're looking directly this way and bring ourselves back down into it. I'm just trying to get you a nice view. There we go. And so now we've got maybe three is too much, so we'll go down to two. And I've got a nice perspective on some of this topography, but it looks still pretty dark, right? So from the data tab, we'll go to the appearance tab, and here we can crank the brightness of the sunlight up and uh, we can also we can reduce the ambient light or increase the ambient light to sort of wash it out a little bit more or less and we can change the position of the sun from morning till afternoon if we wanted to and we can really drag it out so depending on your view a morning morning sun might make it pop a little more than late afternoon sun mm, noontime sun is probably going to make it look pretty pretty washed out um, but early morning sun can really make some of these shadows pop and you can change the height of the sun and you can really really exaggerate some of those shadows and again this is all perspective okay you can also here place a north arrow now the north arrow is going to be dependent on the perspective so if you put it far into the scene it will look smaller than if you place it uh, whoops, closer to the scene right because remember this is perspective you can set an absolute length for the north arrow, um, 2,000 map units, and then when you place it again, click place again, it will get smaller in this case because this will actually be two kilometers in length. You could add another scale bar here, but I find if you scale the north arrow, it's good enough. And again, this is uh, you know not an analytical figure. This is just a, a subjective perspective figure. Um, you can add uh, vectors to the surface over here and in our case we didn't have any selected when we entered 3d view so there are not any in here so let's go back real briefly to the 2d view and let's put our whs sites uh just select them pop back into the 3d view and now there they are and so if we go back into the data tab and we go to the vector portion of it wh sites is here and we can uh, style them. We can pick different symbols, so we can put them back to our little X's, and we can change the color if we didn't like white. We can change them to red or something like that. Um, you know, there's a variety of different symbols that you can choose, 
and you can display them right on the surface or you can make them float a little bit above the surface and depending on you know the symbol that you choose you know that might be okay depending on what you want to do so that's basically the 3d view in a nutshell a perspective view is really really useful one last thing that I will do a little bit later is to show you how to put some different color draped over the top of the topography just kind of like what we did with the hillshade but in our case the color the only color we have right now is the color scheme we picked for our elevation so we need to make some other raster maps first before we can drape on top of it so let's pop into the 2d view mode again I'll just sort of make my sights go away at the moment and I will show you just a couple basic uh, tools that are useful for understanding the uh, specifics about topography not just the, the view and the scale bar but let's firstly get a histogram of the values that are in our map over here so we're going to click on this little button that says analyze map and we have a variety of tools here the one we're going to pick is this one called create histogram of raster map and it brings up the histogram tool it's a pretty simple tool all this is is I'm going to make it big I'm going to make it as big as the whole screen um, these are counts of numbers of cells that have values, numbers in the cell, of the value that corresponds along the x-axis here. So this point right here is a value of 1,000, 1,000 meters above sea level. And if we go up and we go over, we see that somewhere in the realm of 25,000 cells across the whole map that we're looking at have that value of 1,000. And so at each point in our little plot here, the taller the line, the more cells have that particular value. And for our case here, we're looking at this and we're seeing here's sea level. We have a little contingent below sea level. This is stuff that's, you know, in the Jordan Valley heading towards the Dead Sea. And then, you know, we have fairly flat, uh, you know, these sort of lower values. And then we have a big spike right here. And most of the values in our map are somewhere around 800 or so. Uh, meters above sea level, that's the plateau. And then we have a small number of cells that are in the high uplands up to about 1500 meters. So now we see the whole spread of our data and where the concentrations are. Very quickly, this is the default styling. You click this little cog button and you can change the line widths and the colors and you know all the stuff that you want to do over here and you can make the line dashed, you know, something like that. You can change the uh, X and Y scales, make them logarithmic, all kinds of stuff. And you can basically style it so it looks nicer. Under the cog also are text settings and you can pick a, you know, change the labels here. And you can uh, pick a different kind of text, you know, for the, for the text that appears over here. And you can make it larger or smaller and you make it bolder not bold you know whatever you want until you have a plot that looks nice okay so that's a useful thing I use the histogram all the time just to quickly summarize where my data is in this particular map and I say okay this shows me the uplands we have a, you know a fairly s smooth gradation up until this point most of the landscape is somewhere in this sort of like seven to nine hundred meters range and we have a few tall cells to 1500 Let's say we wanted to know the trend in elevation across a specific transect. So let's say I was up here on this ridge, I wanted to walk down through the valley to this ridge and measure the elevation as I went across. That's pretty simple to do. Again, analyze map. And you know we have our basic distance and area measures that we had in QJS, but now we have profile surface of map. And it brings up this profile uh, tool and says, is this the map you want to profile? Click OK. You can profile more than one map at a time if you wanted to. You, this is the sort of blank out the map, and it gives you this pencil tool when you click that button right here. And now you enter your start point, and you enter your end point, and it shows up. And again, you can style it the same way with the same plot and text settings I showed you before. So if you want to change the way this looks, it's easy. There's your start point, and there's your stop point, these little triangles. Now, you can keep going and you can walk around in a, <laughs> in a hexagon if you wanted to. And at each point where there's an inflection, it puts one of those triangles. Now, what I just did is kind of nonsensical. 
So if I so I break it out, but let's say I wanted to follow along the water course. I'm just going to do a quick and dirty job where I'm just sort of using my eye and tapping it in. That becomes more and more useful because this is showing me the elevation trend of the channel bottom as I go, you know, upstream, right? And so now I get, you know, I did that real quick, but if I was a little bit more careful, I could actually get a pretty meaningful little profile out of this. Now there is again a special profile tool so that if I wanted to do this automatically with a pre-made vector line or any set of vector lines like an extracted stream network, I can make profiles automatically using uh, the, the profile tool which is somewhere in here, I can't remember off the top of my head, V profiles or something like that. Okay, we've covered a lot so this might be a time where you take a quick break and uh, we're going to come back and take a look at making some derivative maps from topography. Okay, so thus far we've only worked directly with the DEM itself and we've showed you how uh, to see it in 3D and then to get some uh, derivatives of, uh, you know, just some basic um, statistics about the range of values in this map. Let's make our first derivative map, and that will be a map of slope and then one of aspect. And to do that, we'll go to raster, terrain analysis, and then we'll find the one that says slope and aspect, r.slope.aspect. And yeah, it brings up a brand new map, uh, sorry, uh, tool window. And we're going to pick our map, 30 meter SRTM, the required tab, on the outputs. We can make slope and aspect at the exact same time. So I'm just going to make this one slope and this one aspect. And by the way, remember we talked about the curvatures. We can make curvatures here to profile and tangential and some other derivatives as well. We're not going to bother with that today. We're just going to make slope and output uh, aspect. Um, on the settings tab over here, you generally can leave them alone. But let's say you wanted to change the slope from degrees to percent. And remember in class we talked about the difference between that. This is how you do it. Um, and then here we can create the aspect as degrees clockwise from north, where north would be zero instead of east being zero. If you want to do that, check that box here. Remember we talked about how the fact that it in the GIS often starts with east being zero, whereas in the real world, our compasses have usually have north as zero when they calculate azimuth. So depending on what you want to do with this, you can check this and it might be useful. Uh, but if you're going to chain aspect into anything else in grass, just leave it the default because that's typically how it is uh, expected. So we'll just hit run and we'll chuck through it and we'll make our two maps. And again, because we had add created maps to the layer tree, it adds them in there. Now here's the aspect, and the first thing you're going to notice is that it looks kind of like a hillshade map. They kind of work with the same algorithm. Now, making sure I have my arrow here selected, I'm just going to double click on the the legend, the scale bar, uh, the, sorry, the legend bar, color bar for the raster, and I'm going to switch over to uh, our aspect map. Click OK, and actually I'm going to change the text to be uh, I don't know, yellow or something like that. So we can actually read it. And here we have zero to 360 degrees, right? So basically it's just, you know, around the around the clock <laughs> on the degrees. And the color, the, the, the lightness or the darkness represents which direction you're facing if you're standing on that slope. If we look at the slope map, they give a nicer slope color scheme that's automatically associated with it. And so let's pull that up like so. And uh, I think the yellow will not be a good choice. So let's pick, uh, maybe let's pick black and uh, see what that does. Okay, um, so here we have our slope, zero degrees basically flat. And the steepest slope we have is 72 degrees, which is pretty steep. It's like cliff edge, kind of a steep thing. Um, but basically, we can see here 
values uh, across the map that uh, that change from zero in the flattest areas and as we get to the edges of the canyons they get very steep. Now a useful thing will be to display this color on top of maybe our hill shade. So let's load up our hill shade again and double click on it and then name of raster to drape will instead now pick our slope map. Click OK. And that's looking a little better. I think it's actually too bright in this particular case. So I'm going to uh, darken it. Yeah. And now we're really starting to see things a little bit better here. And likewise, so uncheck that. Only check the SRTM and uh, go because we're going to switch back to the 3D view. So now we're in the 3D view. We go to our data tab and uh, we pick our 30 meter SRTM and here we have surface attributes and we can click the slope map and put the slope map on top of it over here and of course just like before we might have to play around with our with our brightness and um, maybe even our sort of viewpoint so that it makes a little bit more sense for us and we'll have to get ourselves a little higher off the ground and now we can start to see the patterns right a little bit better drag where I want to be there we go okay so now you're starting to see how you can add these different maps as color on top of the topography and you're doing basically data for your visual data fusion when you're doing that okay so we've done our hill, uh, hill shade, we've done our 3D view, slope and aspect. The next thing we're going to do is to automatically use uh, these derivatives of topography, things like slope aspect and the curvatures, to uh, have the GIS automatically classify different landforms. And that tool is unsurprisingly in terrain analysis. <laughs> And there's a couple different ones. There's R Geomorphon and there's R Param Scale. Um, they both work. Let's just stick with R Param Scale for now and you can experiment with R Geomorphon. It works very similarly to this. So we're going to pick our input SRTM and depending here on what we want to output, we can give a different name here. So before I put the name of the output map, let's just take a look at what we can do with this module. And again, I want to just take a plug. They all have manuals, and you can read all about the different things in the manual. Okay, so I always recommend click on the manual. Okay, so firstly, we have the size of a moving window. A 3x3 three three is a fine scale moving window, just three cells by three. But we can increase. We can go from 3x3 three three to 9x9, nine nine, or we can go to you know 10x10, ten ten, or whatever the size we want to do, we can increase it. And that will change the coarseness of the scale of whatever features this thing is going to find. And here's the parameter. Let me just make this screen a little bigger to for it to, for it to calculate. So we can just run a moving window and get the average elevation within that window. That's the default. But we might want to calculate slope at a uh, coarser resolution because maybe a broad scale slope is an important aspect in, let's say, site location behavior. The finer scales of slope doesn't matter. They're just looking for a general surface trend. Okay. Aspect, profile curvature, cross section, all kinds of stuff. You can experiment with doing using this tool for those things and see how it works as you change the spatial scale of the moving window. But what we're interested in is feature. And features are uh, classified landform features. And this in the manual shows you exactly what these are. Peaks, ridges, passes, channels, pits, planar areas, and stuff it can't compute. So if we do this now, and we run, uh, let's just call this landforms 3x3, because we want to put the spatial scale of the moving window, and we hit run, it's going to jug along, and put it underneath for whatever reason, and there it is. And that is cool but it might be a way fine spatial scale for us like these are really small ridges and really small peaks okay so we might want to instead uh, change our moving window to something bigger 
And let's go much bigger. Let's go like 12 by 12. And now we'll change this to 12x12. And we hit run. Uh-oh, too big. Or it's even. So you have to actually pick divisible one. So let's go 11 by 11. And now it will do it. So these are errors that you might get. Uh, again, it just has to be able to make it square with a point in the center. So the numbers actually have to be odd numbers. Now that is looking a little bit more meaningful from my perspective based on the spatial scale. And again, we can just take a look at the legend over here. We can pick our new 12 by 12 landform and click OK. And here we have our... our um, uh, re let me just resize that to something like that, just to make it smaller. And uh, let's say, uh, it's going to make it hard to make a nice f uh, color that you can see, so I'll try white. Oh, terrible. Let's go back to black, and I'll just drag it off, uh, drag it off the bottom of our computational region. Okay. So now you can see that. And by the way, the way I resize is I re-click, I right-clicked on it and I hit resize uh, legend, and I can draw a little box, and you know it will fit it to the box. So if I want to make it big, I can do that. I can make a big box like that, and I'll make a giant legend. <laughs> if I want to make it small, I can draw a much smaller legend. It will fit it to that space. Okay, so pretty useful uh, little tip there to know. Okay. So now I think you can see how the spatial scale of the moving window is going to make a difference for the scale of your analysis. You need to pick a spatial scale that's meaningful. Uh, a 3x3, three three, and remember we have 30x30 30 30 cells, is going to be, uh, what's that, 120x120 120 120 square meters. That's pretty good size. 11x11 um, 11 11 is going to be 330x330 330 330 square meters, which at the landscape scale might be a little bit more meaningful. And again, if we pop our sights on top of that, uh, and uh, I guess the X isn't serving us much anymore, so let's uh, get some pluses. Yeah, that might be helpful when we're doing our predictive model to do it at this, maybe a couple different scales. Okay, param scale is done. Uh, you can play around with that. And again, the other one that does pretty much the same thing is the geomorphons slightly different classification scheme but you can use either of them they have the same kind of search radius deal this one's a little bit more sophisticated so I choose typically choose to go to param scale when I'm doing simple stuff or if it's beginners learning you know about what all these things actually are okay so let's deal with the last little bit here in terms of terrain analysis and we're going to eventually get do cost surface analysis, but that's a big thing. Let's just do flow accumulation, which is a kind of cost surface analysis, but it's the flow of water. We talked about, remember, there are lines, there are places on the landscape where water hits on one side, it flows one way, and if it hits the other way, uh, it goes the other side. Those are watershed boundaries. And they flow until they accumulate to a certain depth of flow. Those are the channels of the channel network. And so the flow accumulation modeling is a way for us to, without going out there and measuring it during a rainstorm, figure out how this would work just based on the properties of uh, derivatives of elevation within the, the GIS. And it's a fairly sophisticated algorithm that does a kind of like a cellular automata where it actually literally does this sort of walking search algorithm to figure out what these pathways are. But luckily the GIS is good at that and it does it fairly quickly. We'll go to raster and now we'll go to hydrologic modeling and we'll pick one called r.watershed, watershed analysis. Now, here we have our one necessary map to put in, which is our DEM. And we can put some other maps in, but we don't, we don't have to worry about that at this particular moment. Now, at this moment, we're only going to do flow accumulation, but this will actually try to automatically delineate watersheds, and you can get maps of the watersheds out. Um, that's a little bit more advanced than what we need to do at this moment. All we really want to do is to get the flow accumulation map because we're going to use it as we go forward uh, in our predictive modeling and stuff that we're eventually going to do. And we also want to extract a stream network. I want to show you how you get a vector 
lines map out of this to show you where the centers of the streams might be. So to do this, we go to the Outputs tab, and we just click Flow Accumulation, and I'm just going to write Flow ACC, simple, straightforward. Um, there are other things that you can output, the drainage direction, stream power index, blah, 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 blah. Some of these require you to have put a number in this minimum size of exterior watershed basin. So we're not going to do any of that. We're just going to do flow ACC. And there's a couple other things over here that you might want to check, like use positive flow accumulation even for underestimates. This are for dealing with edges that flow in from off the map. We don't have to worry about any of this kind of stuff at the moment. You might want to check beautify flat areas if you want it to do a little bit more uh, intensive job in the flattish parts of your map. And if you're getting flow that is, uh, you know, not concentrated enough in streams, you can play with convergence factor. Again, read the manual to know what all that stuff does. But for now, I happen to just check beautify flat areas. You don't have to. The defaults will work fine. And you can see that, you know, depending on the size and resolution of your map, it will go relatively quick or it will take a long time. But basically what we got going on here is, uh, let's get our uh, flow ACC in there. And uh, let me resize this. Uh, we have a map of flow accumulation. Now the only bad thing about not checking the positive flow accumulation for likely estimates is you get a bunch of negative numbers if you got flow coming in from off the map which in most square maps you will. So let me just click the positive one and if I run this now just watch what happens. It says sorry the map exists can't do it. So what you have to do is uh, on the optional tab find uh, allow output files to overwrite existing files. That's a good, that's a safety check, right? So don't check that unless you want it to overwrite the output files, because by default it's trying to save you from accidentally overwriting something you didn't want to overwrite. So now I checked it, I said I want to overwrite it, it's going to overwrite it, and now just watch what happens when it reloads. All the values are positive, and you can actually see quite a few of them uh, uh, you know, get really high. So all these dark numbers here. If we wanted to, we can double click on our legend and we could thin it or where is our subset? That's what we wanted to do. And uh, we can draw a cutoff. It looks like real quick it turns black. So the min would be zero and the max would be uh, let's just put a thousand like that and hit apply and let's even go one more zero so we get some maybe even one more zero okay, too many zeros let's go to 30 yeah let's go to 30,000 that looks like it'll give us basically the range a meaningful range of colors. Now, it's important to note that we are cutting, we are truncating this legend. So the values go up beyond 30,000. So, uh, you know, if you use this to make a figure, you want to make sure you say that you truncated it or change these numbers to basically be zero to a lot. Just make it a relative scale or something like that. Okay. So basically, we can see what's going on now. Um, we basically have uh, uh, a whole bunch of the landscape with not very much flow accumulated, which is good. And we can actually see, so if I zoom in on one of these little areas, we can see how it starts to concentrate into a variety of uh, stream networks. And by the time it gets to the center streams, the value for flow accumulation is big, okay? So let's just click around with this query tool, which I'm not sure if I showed you yet or not. It's pretty straightforward. Click and whatever uh, map you have selected over here, it will show you the values. It's very similar to the little query button in QGIS. So here, where I clicked was a value of 380. And if I click there, the value is 41,000. So if I like this little light blue stream as an actual stream, 
I can see that it starts somewhere around 200 or so, the value for flow accumulation. Now that's going to be useful for when we want to extract our streams because we have to tell it when we think we're in a stream and when we're in a gully or a, a hill slope or something like that. So if you want these light blue things as part of your stream network, you have to give it a value that's low enough so that it will capture all the light blue things. If all you want is blue or dark blue, you can click around. Let's, we can zoom around uh, to a place where we're transitioning from light to dark blue, like there. Uh, and we can click like right here. And look, it's like 1500 would be the number that we're going to use to say only streams from 1500 and higher. So click around until you figure out where you, you're comfortable and where you want your stream networks to basically start. And again, zooming in is useful. And make sure, again, you have the map flow ACC selected because, you know, if I have this one selected and I click over here, um, I might think I'm querying flow accumulation, but in fact I'm querying elevation. All right. If you have both of them selected, by the way, you'll get values for both of them. You just m might have to click on this little arrow to see. So that's kind of a fun and useful thing over here. So values for flow accumulation and values for elevation at the same time in the same place. The other thing I could do is um, oops, let's just select flow ACC is to show a histogram. I, I've used the histogram a lot for this kind of stuff. And in this case, I would have to change it to uh, logarithmic on the x-axis, I believe. Oh, maybe, sorry. Logarithmic on the y-axis. Oops. Plot settings. Yeah. And then I could start to see, you know, where cutoffs might exist. But probably simpler just to click around with the, with the query tool, like I was showing you. Okay, let's extract the stream network. To do that, going back to raster, hydrologic modeling, and then we're going to go down to r.stream.extract, extraction of stream networks. Now, it will do the flow accumulation for you if you haven't run it already. I just wanted to show you the flow accumulation map. So you can choose here the SRTM, and then we're going to come back to this value we have to type in. Or you can also choose the created flow ACC map, but that will just speed it up. It won't have to remake it every single time. So I often do that if I have a flow accumulation map. But you will also have to put the elevation because it's anything with a red asterisk is required. It just won't run without it. And here's where we put that number. So if I like 1500 as my cutoff, I just type in 1500 right here. And that will be the minimum flow accumulation for it to be counted as a stream. Anything smaller will not be in the network of streams. Anything larger will be. And then output maps, we can do it uh, a raster map of the streams and a vector map of the stream. And we could also put flow direction. So let's do streams both as a raster and as a vector because we're going to use the raster for when we do cost analysis. So we'll just want to make it right now. But typically, you're mostly interested in making the vector map because this is a, 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 a nice hierarchical nested vector map and you can do network analysis along it and you can do things like stream order and that kind of stuff like we talked about in class. So here I'm just going to write streams uh, 1500 just so I know my cutoff and I'll just do the same. Now they can have the same name, but because one is a vector and one is a raster, it's not going to get confused. It's going to put them in their place, okay? And if you really want to, you can call this this one vect and this one rast, just so if in your mind when you're looking at your list of maps, it, it reinforces what is actually there. Now there's a few other things that you could check here, but it's probably fine at this particular moment uh, for the basic run that we're doing here. So hit run. You can see it's already doing its flow accumulation, but that's okay. And boom, there we go. Okay, so what do we have out of here? Let's just uh, let's just get rid of our flow accumulation map. So we're looking at this, and let's actually look at it on top of the hillshade. 
And for the hill shade, I'm going to go back to just the um, just our regular SRTM, and I'm going to just put it back the way we had it before, like so. Just so it's a little bit easier for us to see. So, firstly, we made the two maps. We have the raster version, which is there. Um, we'll deal with that when we do cost analysis, but for now, let's just look at the stream vector network. Well, okay, what do we have going on here? Let me zoom in to one of these little areas where we extracted some streams. Okay, so what we have is a vector lines map, but also inside are vector points. There are actually two types of vector geometries in here. The lines are the streams, right? They are connected to each other, so you can actually do this as a network. But at each initiation and at each juncture, you also have put uh, uh, have a vector point put into this file. If we don't want to see the points, we double click on this one, we get our dvect, and it says, uh, let me just make this a little bit bigger, selection, and we have point, line, boundary, centroid, area, or face. Normally, if you only have one geometry type, it doesn't matter if any of all of these are checked because you only have one geometry type in your file, but here we have two geometries. So let's uncheck point, hit apply, and the points will not be displayed. And they're still in the file, they're just not being displayed. So if you're annoyed at having a bunch of X's, do it like that. Conversely, if all you wanted to see were the points where the places where uh, streams initiated and where they joined together, uncheck line, hit apply, and now we'll only look at those points and no line. All right. Now, that might be useful if you're a hydrologist, but for most of us, uh, we want to actually see the lines over here. Uh, so there we go. Um, and of course, we could change the color. It might be nice to make it a nice kind of funky blue. Uh, hit apply like that. And um, what we can do is to change the overall width of the lines, like so. Um, or I think we can do it this way. I'm not, I can't remember what's in the column for this, but let's just hit apply. No. Okay. We would have to apply, I think we'd have to apply like straw or stream order, and then we can have the widths of the lines be related to the, to the point in the stream. Okay. I'd have to look up the table to, 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 to steer you that way. Uh, so let's just get rid of that and hit apply to get our lines back to three. Okay, so there we have it. We have extracted the stream network. We have got slope and aspect. We've got landform. We've done a lot of terrain analysis, all based on a single uh, DEM. So I think what I'll do is I will actually wait on the rest of project, uh, sorry, what is it, step two or whatever it is in project two about using the SQL because that actually took a little bit longer than I thought. So I will make a uh, sort of mini practicum at the beginning of next week to cover this little bit over here. But for now, if you can follow me up to this point where you have all of these things going on, uh, you are doing very good in your first actual real analyses in grass. And I hope that as you use it and you get used to some of the tools, uh, and the way that grass works, you can see how it enhances your ability to do rapid fire analyses of these kind compared to doing it in something like QGIS, which you can do a lot of this stuff, if not all of this stuff exactly the same. It's just a little bit much, a little bit more difficult to manage all these data. And you have to worry about the projections and I guarantee you, you're gonna come across even more errors because you have to get things set up exactly just right. So okay, keep an eye out for the next little mini practicum about the SQL querying of the sites.